So these studies uh, are harder to teach than like just going through a portion because tonight we're actually going to go through uh, at a fast pace, of course, we're going to go through the entire book of Jonah. And it's a challenge because, you know, you want to stop and and kind of go deep on certain spots, but you can't because we need to get to the end. So tonight I've entitled the message, Jonah, the man that ran from God. Now, in your book, the chapter said, finding strength in times of disobedience. And I don't know what she may have meant by that, but I find that a hard title to grasp for myself. Maybe it means something different to you, but for me, I, I've never found strength when I'm being disobedient. I have never found strength when I'm being disobedient. When I'm disobedient, I have no strength. Because when I'm disobedient, I'm doing things in my strength. So I changed it, or I'd like to reframe it if I may. Surrendering to God's sovereignty even when you don't want to. <laughs> you could say surrendering to God's sovereignty when you don't feel like it. Because that's really the heart of the issue with Jonah. Jonah should have surrendered right in the beginning. God said, get up and go to Nineveh. And he's like, peace, I'm going in a completely different direction. Now, the book of Jonah is interesting. The book of Jonah, because Jonah's a prophet, right? So the book of Jonah is more about what God did in the messenger than the message. All the other prophets that we see throughout the Old Testament there's all the focus on their message and very little about the prophet. But I think because we see in Jonah God's willingness to allow a stubborn man to walk away from his perfect will, but steer him back. As soon as Jonah stepped on that ship, he was getting the GPS redirect. He was, he was going to end up in Nineveh one way or another, right? So, and don't get me wrong, I mean, I'm not making light of, and neither would any commentator, I don't think, making light of all that God did by sparing Nineveh, and we'll see a little peek of that tonight. Behind the scenes, though, we get to see the struggle Jonah had with his enemies being saved. Think about this tonight as we go through this. Who, who is it that you I, I would say, like to see saved the least. And I don't mean like there's progressions of salvation. I mean, who's the last person that you would want to see in heaven? Think about that for a moment. I think I, think I could speak for us all, and we would be wrong, but I would say for many of us, it would probably be many in the Democrat Party that are leading. I'm not saying, I don't mean, I want to clarify, I don't mean Democrats in general. I mean the ones leading the charge, they're, the ones that are out there, they're just totally against God, right? If God said, go and preach to them, I could see myself being like, ah, I think I'll go somewhere. Are they in D.C.? I'm heading to Hawaii, okay? I'm not saying I wouldn't. I'm saying I might struggle with that. I, I, and I'm trying to think, who could it be that I would find myself in this position with? So turn to Jonah 1, and we're going to see point number one, Jonah's disobedience. Jonah's disobedience. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, is there anywhere that you could flee from the presence of the Lord? No. No. Now, the word of the Lord occurs seven times throughout the book of Jonah. Seven times. He says, go to Nineveh. Now, in your, and I'm going to do this throughout, but in your book, in your homework book, on page 74, the question was asked, what did God instruct Jonah to do? Well, he instructed him to go to Nineveh. Why is the question? Why did God instruct Jonah to go to Nineveh? Well, the answer is to cry out against it for their wickedness. In other words, to call them to repent. Jonah was told to go and preach and call them to repentance. Now, Jonah's name means dove. Jonah's name means dove. D 
Does this story seem far-fetched to you that God would take a man and put him in the belly of a fish? Well, I just want you to know that Jesus confirmed that Jonah was a real man. In Luke chapter 11, verse 30, Jesus said, For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. So this is a true story that we're looking at. This is not a made-up story. This is not one of those, and I've heard people say, well, it wasn't a fish, it was actually a whale, and it was probably this type of whale, blah, 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 blah. I would disagree. I would say it was a Jonah fish. It was the only one in existence that has ever existed, and it was specifically designed to swallow Jonah. Just think about that. God, before he told Jonah to go to the Ninevites, knew what Jonah would do. He already had a fish swimming around in the Mediterranean waiting for Jonah. Think about that for a moment. God, in his sovereignty, he knows what you and I are going to do. He's already got a plan to get us where he wants us to be. Now, Jesus confirmed that he was swallowed by a great fish in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. He says, and a Evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, and no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, Jonah, if you turn to 2 Kings chapter 14, we're going to get a little more backstory on Jonah. 2 Kings 14, verse 23. It says, in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat, who made Israel sin. He restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Hefer. So here we see that Jonah had prophesied at other times. But notice, we're not given all of Jonah's prophecies. All the stuff that Jonah did, we're just focused here in the book of Jonah on Jonah and his disobedience. But we also see his recovery out of that, right? So he's told to go to Nineveh, to the Ninevites. Now, the capital of Assyria was Nineveh. So the inhabitants were Assyrians. I did not know this. Did you know that Nineveh is modern-day Mosul in Iraq? Who knew that? Wow, you guys are way smarter than I am. I did not know that. I found that very interesting. I was like, wow, it's modern-day Mosul. So you can go to Mosul, to, not that you would want to go to Mosul today. But if you could go to Mosul today, you could go visit the ancient city of Nineveh. So these guys at that time were extremely bloody, extremely violent. Look at Nahum chapter 3. And we're going to get a little insight into the Ninevites. By the way, you can read all of chapter 3. I only pulled out a couple of verses. There's way more, okay? But chapter 3, verse 1 says, Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. Wait, is that Nineveh or Washington, D.C.? Is that San Francisco? L.A.? Sacramento? Washington? Like, I mean, this sounds like today, right? It's like everywhere you look, I mean, you guys, the only thing I know about the Dodgers right now are all the fights happening at the stadium. They're like in the playoffs, I guess, with the Padres. Who's Padres fans in here? And you admit it? No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Who's, Who's Dodgers fans in here? But see, tonight, look at all this. We can all get along because it's just a game. And we're still brothers in Jesus, right? We'll have fun poking at each other. Pastor Rob is a Padres fan. I don't know if you guys know that. Pastor Rob's a Padres fan, and I grew up, my dad was a Dodgers fan, but I don't really care. I am not that into baseball. I just have fun tormenting Pastor Rob about the, the Padres, right? So the, but the reality is I, go, I turn on the news, and what do I see? It's just everybody's fighting. For what? I'm thinking, what happened at the game? Your team lost, and you want to go out and punch someone in the face? That's exactly where this society had come. They were at a place where everybody was fighting everybody. That's what's happening in our streets. 
Nobody cares about anybody. It's, I am more important than you, and it doesn't matter. I was driving up the freeway right now. There's a guy in a, I'll just leave his card without describing it, because maybe it was one of you. <laughs> but he was on his phone doing like 60 in the fast lane. Okay, at least do 65. But the reality is he's like this on his phone, and everybody's going around him. And I'm like, what are you doing? And I thought, well, he's probably coming to church. <laughs> Nahum 3.3 says, horsemen charge with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. There's so many dead, they're stumbling over them. That's Nineveh. That's where God told Jonah to go. The society that when you looked at it, you would say, it's a lost cause. Why would I go there? Why would I go to San Francisco? It's a lost cause. It's, it's a trash heap. I'm sorry, we've turned a first world country into a third world country. People forgot how to use the bathroom. And we'd say, it's a lost cause. You write it off. What if God says, go? No, I only want to go to Texas. Well, not you. I'm preaching to the choir here because you guys are still here. But do you see what I'm saying? Oh, I want to go where? I want to go to the conservative state. I am not going to go somewhere that is a lost cause. Why? If God tells you to go, are you, who are you to tell God no? Who am I to tell God no? If God says Shadrach go, who am I to tell God no? So Jonah's response, he boarded a ship and headed in the opposite direction. Now, why do you think he responded that way? On page 74, question two, why do you think he responded that way? And I believe it's because he didn't want to see his enemy spared. He wanted to see God's justice. Don't we want to see God's justice? I mean, when you see what's happening in the world around you, don't you want to see God's justice? I do. He didn't want to see God's mercy. He didn't want to see God's forgiveness. He didn't want to see God's grace extended to the Ninevites. He wanted to see God's justice. But like I asked in the beginning, what if God called us to be a spokesman to the Democratic Party to call them to repentance? What if they were all gathered together and he said, I want you to go sit down with them and tell them to repent? So he got on a boat at Joppa, modern-day Jaffa in Israel, and he headed to Tarshish. Did you know that from Joppa to Tarshish is 2,500 miles by boat? Do you know where Tarshish is? It's southern Spain, exactly. He's in Israel, and he's like, I'm going to Spain. I'm a Spaniard. <laughs> going to Spain. Somewhere between Israel... And I started to think about this. Was it a, was it a three day? I mean, I don't, I don't recall reading how long it took to get out to the ocean before the storm happened. But it took three days for the fish to get him back. 2,500 miles away. From where he was to Nineveh was only 500 miles. Only 500 miles. He's like, I'm going as far as I can from that place. So we look at Jonah's journey, point number two, in verse four of Jonah one. But the Lord sent out. Now, you should circle the word but. But. Because look at what all Jonah did, but then it says, but the Lord. <laughs> you got to be careful when you don't do what God says, and then it's, then of, of our life, it would say, but the Lord. You don't want to but the Lord in your life. You don't. You want to. Therefore, <laughs> God said, then therefore, you know, like, but not, you don't want a but, but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid. These guys were, this, this is the equivalent when the disciples were out on the Sea of Galilee and that storm came onto the Sea of Galilee and they were afraid. 
These guys are normally out in the water. There is not much that frightens them. So when something frightens them, it means it's out of the ordinary. It's abnormal. It's unusually tempestuous. Think about the disciples. They were out on the Sea of Galilee in a storm because that's where they were supposed to be. Jesus told them, get up and go to the other side. So they were there to be perfected, but Jonah was here to be corrected. Jonah was running away from God's perfect plan and will. So now there's this storm, and it's breaking up the ship. Verse 5, the mariners were afraid. Every man cried out to his God. Well, that didn't work. So they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down to the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. He's like, he can't believe it. He's beside himself. Notice there's not, he's like, what, you must be an atheist. There's no atheist back then. They all believed in gods, right? So he's like, what are you doing? Go call on your God. We called on ours. It didn't work. Their gods didn't answer. And they knew that. So you go call on your God. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, please tell us for whose cause is this trouble on us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So I think it's interesting because it says Jonah was asleep and God interrupted his plan. I don't know how he could have gone down and slept in that mess. Those guys are all afraid for their lives, but not Jonah. Why? Why wasn't Jonah afraid? I mean, we could speculate, right? Maybe Jonah wasn't afraid because he really just had a death wish. He's like, go ahead and kill me, God. And he, maybe he was challenging God to kill him. I mean, maybe because he says, throw me in the sea and it'll be calm for you, right? Page 75, question five, says, what stands out about Jonah's response to the storm in the men? I said, the thing that stands out to me is the complacency and the indifference. His complacency and his indifference. He didn't care. I don't care. Let him die. Smite him. Maybe he thought, if I don't go and I don't tell him to repent, then they can't repent and then God will judge them. I mean, that is logical, right? But is it true? I mean, what do you know of God? Is, is that the way God works? Oh, you won't go, so I'll nuke him? No, God usually is like, all right, you won't go. Either he'll make you willing to go or he'll raise up someone else to go. He's not going to hang their salvation on your head. He wants you to be a part of the solution. If you don't want to be, he could use somebody else, but he also could make you willing because he loves you. I think one other thing that stands out to me about this passage is I had someone recently totally in the middle of sin tell me that they didn't have any conviction about it because they had a peace. Uh, Let me just say, I don't care when you say, oh, I have a peace about it. That means nothing. It means nothing. It means less than nothing. Like if nothing was here, and you say, I have a peace about it, that's even less than. And the reason for that is because, look, Jonah was in the middle of complete and utter disobedience. And what does he do? He goes in and goes to sleep. Jonah could say, I have a peace about it. I'm, I'm doing what I think God told me to do. That's what I hear people say. I'm going to divorce I have, I have no conviction about it. That could be a very, very bad thing, you know, because it could mean that you seared your conscience with a hot iron and you are past the point of feeling. That would be a very bad place to be. And then you say, I have a peace about it. That's a very dangerous place to be. You should never make an assumption because you have a peace about something that that means it's right. First, search the scriptures and see if the Bible speaks to any situation. Because if it does and it tells you something different, then your peace is completely erroneous. And what God said stands, and that's what matters. Do you understand? And so any of this other stuff, we need to cast it out the window. Now, I think the other thing that's interesting right here is Jonah says that he feared the Lord. Uh, But did he? (laughs) He's like, I fear the God of the Hebrews. Ah, I don't know if you do. Yeah, I don't know if you do, Jonah. I mean, he said go, and if you feared the Lord, you'd just go. But he didn't. So I don't know. In that moment, 
He, why did he disobey him? So let's look at point number three, Jonah's solution. His solution, verse 10 to 12, the men were exceedingly afraid. They said, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me in the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this tempest is because of me. So he offered himself in their place. Why didn't he jump out of the boat? Why didn't he jump out? Coward. It's like, throw me out. Jump out, Jonah. These guys didn't want his blood on their hands. He's like, commit murder and it'll be calm for you. I don't know what he was thinking. Why didn't he just jump? I don't know. Point five, Jonah's sacrifice. They cried out to the Lord. Now, this is how I know they didn't want his blood on their hands. Look at what they say. We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as you please. Wait a minute. What happened to all this talk about their gods? All of a sudden, they realized their gods were powerless. They probably realized, wait a minute. The, The things that we've been serving are not gods. And so they're now recognizing the one true God. They picked Jonah up and they threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Why? Because in the moment that they were contemplating all this on the ship, they recognized, okay, there's like the, the thought of you told us this, We think it might be true. I mean, it could just be that we've never been in a storm like this before. However, we drew the lots and they landed on you. You're saying you're a Hebrew. We're not familiar with this God of yours, right? It could be all that stuff. And now all of a sudden, the sea stops. Well, you know as well as I do, storms don't just stop like that, right? And all of a sudden, the sea is calm. Then... The realization that, wait a minute, he really is God. And look at what he did. Whoa. I wonder if they got to see Jonah swallowed by the fish. Do you think it was like they threw Jonah in and the fish came up and was like, Poof. or do you think the ship sailed away and they were like watching <laughs> Jonah's, bye guys. <laughs> Have a good voyage. I mean, I kind of hope it was like, you know, if you go whale watching and you see a a humpback breach. I hope it was like that. Just the fish came up and and they're like. Maybe I think about this a little too much. Verse 16, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they took vows. So they cried out. They tried to row to land. They didn't want to pick Jonah up and throw him into the sea. They tried to spare his life. But accepting their fate and understanding Jonah was the key to their trouble, they threw him overboard. I mean, they got to the point where it was like your life or ours. And look, we're not the one running away from God. You are. I mean, think about this little mini missions trip that Jonah went on. When we disobey God, there are consequences. And unfortunately, we don't bear them alone. These poor sailors were going to bear the consequences of Jonah's sin. Along with him. But God is good. God is gracious. gracious. He spared them, right? Page 79, question 2 says, Why do you think the sailors called on the Lord instead of continuing to cry to their own gods? And I said, because they recognized their gods had no power and that Jonah's God was all powerful. Then page 80, verse seven says, how did God use a bad situation for good? And I said, because he showed the mariners his glory. And I think that ultimately they they would have come to a saving faith. They would have come to a saving faith. Jonah's repentance and recognition. What are we on, point six? Is that five? I don't actually have the point numbers in my notes. I don't know why. They're just on the PowerPoint. Jonah 1.17, and it says, The Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. 
And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is where, you know, people who are marine biologists, like they, they like scour the oceans and try to find something that would have been able to, to swallow Jonah. And if they can't find something, they're like, well, then this story is not true. Because, oh, uh, I know, because fish have never gone into extinction, right? Plus, you know, how much of the earth's surface is water? Like, I was going to say, close to 80%, correct? And uh, how much of it is unexplored? I mean, we're sending eyes out into space. We still haven't even explored the depths of our own oceans. I learned that at SeaWorld when I was a kid. So... Jonah prayed, chapter 2, verse 1, to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly. Wait, when did he pray? How long did it take? The, like the third day. So he sat there for... Could you imagine just sloshing around? And the smell? Just... God, you're not going to make me do anything. It's how I feel sometimes. And my, growing up, nobody was going to make me do anything. My friends tried. Tried to pressure me into stuff. Nope. I'm not that kind of guy. You're not going to pressure me into doing something. And, the, and here's what happens. The more you try, the more obstinate I will get. Unless I, unless I see that it's something that I should do. Right, that would be different. But if you're trying to pressure me into doing something that I don't want to do, I'm not going to do it. I will not. My friends tried. Lots of people have tried over the years, and I'm just like, nope, nope. Now walk away. I don't care. I don't care what names you call me. I don't care. I'm not an idiot. Oh, I mean, I am an idiot, but I'm not that kind of an idiot that I would do something because someone calls me a name or dares me. I was never that guy. I dare you. I had fun daring guys to do stuff. So I had one friend, I would dare him, and he would do it. Especially if I called him a girl. He was just that kind of guy. And one day he was like, he you know, this big, tall, yellow pole. He ran up to it like he was going to jump it. And I said, oh, you're not going to jump it? And he goes, no. I said, because you're a chicken? And he's like, no, you're not going to talk me into it. I said, oh, because you're a girl. And then he's like, backed up, and he ran. And he, I mean, he barely made it over. Barely, and that was before like YouTube and all that stuff where I could have made a lot of money off of that video. So he waits three whole days. Verse two, I cried to the Lord because of my affliction and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the floods surrounded me and all your billows and waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. Like think about what he's saying. The waters surrounded me so that it affected even my soul. Because you, look, if I go surfing, I'm sitting in the water. I'm like, like, oh, the water is all the way up to my soul. Do you understand what Jonah's saying? That this situation has now affected him to the point where his soul is moved. It's not just his physical body. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have bought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Not even the depths of the sea kept Jonah's prayer from the temples or the courts of our living God. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord, listen, spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. I wonder if the fish was just swimming around until Jonah got done praying. Right when he got done praying, and out came Jonah. Just Could you imagine? Stuff wrapped around his head. Some have speculated that his skin like he would have been super white from being inside. I mean, we have no idea. These are all speculation, right? 
He's all, like if you sit in the bathtub too long or sit in the pool too long and go swimming, you're all wrinkled up. You know, Jonah was not good looking when he came out of this thing. And then he goes in, he's like, repent. And they're probably like, oh, we saw a ghost. <laughs> he sure thought he was going to die. But I think he came to the realization, God didn't put me in the middle of this, this fish to die. I mean, I'm still alive. If God wanted me dead, I should have already been dead. So now it's just a waiting game. Well, I'll just say this. I've heard Pastor Jack say it lots of times. You can never outweigh God. You can never outweigh God. Oh, that's a good thing, but it could also be a bad thing. You could never outstubborn God. God loves you so much, and he loves other people. And if he wants to use you to do something, he'll put you into a position where he'll make you willing to do it. And he's done it with me many a times because there's things in my life that I said I would never do. And then the Lord's like, watch this, Shadrach. You're going to be willing to do it. And then when you do it, you're going to be so glad you did it. And that's the way it usually works. Now, I'm not saying Jonah was because at the end he's still pretty peeved. So the Lord prepared a great fish. Page 84, question one. Why do you think God appointed a fish to swallow Jonah instead of just rescuing him out of the sea? Well, because I don't think Jonah was in a place to repent. If Jonah had just, like, been tossed into the water and, you know, tossed around, got a little water in his lungs, you know, if God gently waterboarded Jonah for a couple of days and then put him back to the shore, I think Jonah wasn't in a place to repent. It took that time. In, in such a severe situation, there was no way out of it. Think about it. We can find ourselves in situations that we think there's no way out of this. There's no way out of this situation. Well, there may not be anywhere that you can get yourself out of, but as soon as you look up, as soon as you pray, your prayer enters into the holiest place of all. So he was there for three days and three nights. Remember in Matthew 12 that Jesus said that he was there for three days and three nights. What will it take to get us to pray? I sure hope not being in the belly of a fish. I hope not something miserable that we would finally pray to God. You know, we don't pray to God when things are good. Often we, we just kind of forget. We go about our daily business, but we need to make sure that we're praying even when things are good. Like right now, maybe we're praying more than normal because we're desperate. We see the, just the horrific things happening in our nation. I mean, if it's not bad enough that we had a hurricane, it's completely being mismanaged. Are you seeing the news that even people who are going in to help are being told, no, you can't go help? Are you kidding me? It has to be a government agency now? Only someone with a, a government seal now can go in and help people? What, how, well, that's ridiculous. We gotta be able to go help people. If an earthquake happened here, I mean, are we gonna, are we, we're all gonna sit around and wait for the government to come save us? If your neighbor's trapped in the house, you can say, sorry, you got to wait for FEMA. Sorry, FEMA hasn't given me permission to come and help rescue you out of your house. They've got special training, you know. Government training. I'm sure they had all their DEI training. <laughs> what was Jonah's view of God? On page 84, I said, one who listened. He sees God as one who listens. The moment that he prayed, he knew God would listen. One who would deliver him. And I mean out of the fish and one who would save him. I love that he says, I will yet again see. He knew I am not going to stay in this position. But God has a plan. So Jonah's message, point six, Jonah three. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose, and he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. And he cried out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now some think that it was just a densely packed city and it would take Jonah three days to serpentine his way through. That's not how I read this. How I read this is the city is so great in extent, it took three days to walk across the city. 
What was his message? Very simple. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 40 days. Why do you think God, it says on page 89, question two, why do you think God gave them a timeline? And I would say because God is merciful and compassionate. And he does that all throughout the Old Testament. He does it with the nation of Israel. He's like, look, you guys have gone and you're worshiping false gods. And then he tells them, repent. I'm, and then he gives them time to repent. Like, does he have to give them time to repent? No. He could say, look, if you guys don't repent by tomorrow, you're all dead. I mean, if you're serious, you'd be like, oh, wow. I, should. I mean, in this case, it took three days to walk across the city. He could have said, I'll be super gracious and give you one more day. You have four days to repent. No, he gives them 40 days. 40 days to repent. Numbers chapter 14, verse 18 says, the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving in iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty. If they had not repented, they would have been destroyed. Make no mistake about it. If they had not repented, they would have been destroyed. And God does this with nations throughout history. You understand this? That if a nation continues in its sin, there's a point at which God will judge the nation. He will not at all acquit the wicked. And that's where we're at as a country. We see the impending judgment of God upon a nation. And we need to repent as a nation. We could say, well, yeah, you're right. Those people need to repent. Yeah, but we need to repent. I need to repent. Ezekiel 18, verse 23 says, Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't rejoice in the day that a wicked man dies. He's grieved by it. He's grieved by what they did, of course. But he doesn't rejoice in it. 2 Peter 3, 9 says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's desire. Is that going to happen? The answer is no. But in the case of the Ninevites, it did. Let's look at Jonah 3, 5, the Ninevites' repentance. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. He laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh. It's pretty wild. They all repented. What? Like, you, you could see that could happen in our country. But do we believe it? I mean, honestly, do we believe it? I don't. I'm being honest. I don't. I don't believe if, if we cried out to our nation to repent or judgment, I don't think they would. I, I just think they just keep going, right? But do you understand that it could happen? Do you understand that? It happened with Nineveh. Nineveh was worse than where we're at. Worse. You say, well, Shadrach, how do you know that? Go read Nahum 3. They're worse. They're tripping over dead bodies. Are we tripping over dead bodies? No. You're not. Even in Chicago. Yeah, there are a lot of people shot and getting, they're dead. But we're not tripping over them. It's not like you're just driving down the 91 freeway. People are getting out of the car, shooting each other. And you're driving down the 91 freeway trying to get home. Ba-doom. Ba-doom, just running over people. You're not doing that. But they did. Page 89, question four. What stands out about the Ninevites or the way that that they responded? Well, they believed God, which is pretty interesting because they were worshiping all their false gods and all their false gods gave them license to do whatever they wanted. And now they're surrendering to the true God, the one true God, and they proclaimed a fast, which means they went from complete gluttony to complete self-denial. They covered themselves in sackcloth and ashes instead of being clothed in things that are comfortable. I remember when the first high school students came into the high school ministry wearing their mother's jeans. 
it wasn't, they weren't cross-dressing. They were wearing them because they were stretchy. And we all said, why are you wearing your mom's pants? I remember telling a student, stop wearing your mom's pants to church. I mean, we had a good relationship. So I didn't just walk up to a random student and say, stop wearing your mom's pants. I knew that he was wearing his mom's pants. I was like, why are you wearing your mom's pants? He says, because they're comfortable. I'm like, yeah, but they're your mom's pants. Then the design industry got smart, and they started putting stretchy material in men's pants. Why do we have to wear pants that are so, like, tight, you, you, you can't, you have to, like, pull them up before you could squat down, to, you know, like if you're a plumber or something. Like, I remember having to work under sinks. I did some plumbing for a while. I remember trying to get down there with those old, just straight cotton jeans, and now, these things are amazing. It's like wearing sweatpants all the time, but they look like regular pants. These are men's pants. They're men's pants. I want to make that clear. They're men's pants, but they are stretchy. They're comfortable. These guys went from wearing what was comfortable to wearing sackcloth and ashes. They afflicted themselves. We see their change. They went from gluttony to fasting. Jonah 3.10, then God saw their works. He saw what they did, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So the message was effective because God told them, because, sorry, uh, Jonah told them what God told them. Nothing more, nothing less. He didn't add to it. He didn't take away from it. How do we know that they really repented? Jesus confirmed that they repented. Turn to Luke chapter 11, verse 31. I think this is pretty awesome. Luke 11, verse 31. Jesus says, The queen of the south will rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh, listen to this, will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Isn't that awesome? These guys all, I mean, we would say they got saved. They changed. They didn't just say it. They did it. We see that in their behavior and in their attitude. And then in chapter 4, we, we see Jonah's bad attitude. He's pretty peeved that these guys all repented. He was like, man, I was hoping for a heavenly barbecue. I wanted to see you guys all destroyed. Look at verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. <laughs> what a stinker. You want to get in heaven and see if Jonah's hanging out with some Ninevites? Because I'll bet you he is, right? But at that point, he was like so mad. He's like, I knew God was going to forgive him. <laughs> so he prayed to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? He's like, God, I told you so. He, but it doesn't, it did the wrong, it's like the wrong kind of I told you so. Because the regular I told you so works when you tell someone not to do something, and then they do it, and then they get hurt as a result. And then, come on, guys, don't you, doesn't it feel good sometimes? You, and we, we shouldn't say it, but we want to. We say, maybe we don't say it, but we want to say, I told you so. I told you if you did that, that, that would, that's what would happen. This is like the reverse. Jonah goes, preaches his message. They all repent. And then he's like, I told you so. God's like, <laughs> it doesn't work that way, Jonah. Therefore, I, fret, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. It is better for me to die than to live. What a, what a turd. I'm sorry. I know it's not a sanctified word. But what, what an awful attitude. But we could be the same way. But th he's like, just kill me. Just kill. You should have killed me when I was in the fish. Now kill me. Just let me die. I don't want to see these people in heaven. 
Like, that's pretty bad, right? I hope there's nobody in your life that you're like that. I, do, I hope I don't see them in heaven. There was a guy that I used to work with. He was um, really ornery. And he would say vulgar things. My, my last job, I worked for Newport Mesa Unified School District. I was a groundskeeper. And I worked around all the custodians and the, and the plumbers and all that stuff. And I learned a lot of trades there working with those guys. But one of the guys, he was a plant manager at one of the high schools. And he loved to tell me vulgar things. And now I would joke with him and I would tell him if you ever stepped in a church, it would burn down. I would joke. He knew. Because he would say stuff to me and I would say clean, nice kind of funny stuff back to him. But he would say stuff to me all the time. And, and I'll never forget, I had been on staff for, I don't know, less than a year. And we went to the Harvest Crusade with a group of our youth. And I was sitting there at the stadium, you know, with the students who were talking, hanging out. And I get smacked up at the back of my head. And I was like, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to punch someone in the face right now. It hurt. And it startled me. And you know how you feel when that happens? I stood up and I turned around and I was trying not to look like I'm going to punch you in the face, but that's what I felt like. I, I turned around and it was this guy. And I wanted to say, I never in a million years thought that I would see you here. And I'm surprised the place hasn't burned down. I wanted to say that. I did not say that. I said, oh my gosh, I'm so glad to see you. And who brought you here? He said, my son. And I worked with his son. We all, we all worked together at, at the same place. And I was, then I was like, okay. But I thought, well, maybe his son invited him in hopes that he will get saved. So I was like, oh, really? Yeah, okay. Well, like, do you like go to church or anything? He's like, yes, I do. I was like, are you a Christian now? And he said, yes, I am. Prove it. <laughs> Let me see some sackcloth and ashes. Let me see some repentance. You owe me. No, I just said, I said, I am so glad. I'm so glad. And then I thought back, what if I had really just been a, a horrible witness to this man? In this moment, I'm not saying I led him to Jesus. What I am saying is that my witness would have affected him. And what I was thankful for in that moment, I'm not saying it's always been this way, but in that moment, I was like, I had... I had no like, oh, I wish I hadn't said that that one day. It was none of that. It was just, wow, it's going to be awesome. We're all going to be in heaven together. I still see pictures of him. As a matter of fact, his son, his son invited me recently to go connect with him and some of the other guys I used to work with. I was just unable to. I already had appointments that day. But what a blessing. So Jonah is upset. He says, take my life. So verse 5, he goes out of the city. He sits on the east side of the city. And there he made a shelter for himself under the shade, that he might see what would become of the city. I think he's still holding out that God might destroy it. He's like, maybe they all didn't repent. Maybe there's a little hope. Maybe if God, you could just, maybe some smoke could arise from over there, you know, like somewhere. Can I just, or maybe some brimstone comes down on them. I don't know. Some other nation comes in and raids them. Verse 6, and the Lord God prepared a plant, and he made it come over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. Could anything have delivered Jonah from his misery? Seems like a pretty miserable guy already, right? But God's even being gracious to Jonah. He's even showing Jonah. Even in the middle of his bad attitude, he's showing his grace. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head, and he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself. Again, he said, it's better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you? To, well, we skipped the part of the um, worm eating it, right? But is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. I, you know, if I was God, I would have stopped his heart for about 30 seconds. He said, I would. Uh, uh, uh. Are you serious, Jonah? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> but the Lord said, You have had pity on a plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should I not have pity 
on Nineveh, the great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern from their right hand or their left and much livestock? And that's like the end of the book. (laughs) That's like the end of the story. God's making a point with this plant. Jonah's mad about a plant. He's mad that the plant died. But he doesn't care if 120,000 people die. Talk about having messed up priorities. God, I just want this one plant to live. I don't care if all my neighbors perish. But I need this one plant to live. I mean, I have been watering this thing. I've been tending this thing. This thing is so beautiful. I put all my energies and, and everything into it. But if the whole neighborhood goes up in flames, that's fine. Just spare my one plant. That's the, that's the kind of attitude that Jonah has. He's displeased. And he has a death wish. Just kill me. Page 95, question six. What did God want to teach Jonah through this? That he cared more. Jonah cared more about a plant than people. God's perspective is what must be gained, gentlemen. We must gain God's perspective on all things. And when it comes to the world and stuff, God cares more about people. God cares more about people. What has he been telling you to do? Do not come to me tonight and say, God's not been telling me to do anything. Uh Uh-uh. He has. You haven't been listening. You haven't been listening. I don't know. If you said, I don't know, you haven't been listening. Because he's telling you. He's directing you. I promise you. I promise you God has been speaking to you and God has been directing you. If you don't know, it's because you're not listening. When it comes to lost souls, when it comes to coworkers, when it comes to family, when it comes to our country, we must have God's perspective on all things. God is love, he is merciful, and he is gracious, and he wants to use you to be an instrument to win lost souls to himself. He uses people to share with people so that more people might be in the kingdom of God. You're going to go to heaven when you die? Great. He wants more people around you to go to heaven because they're seeing your life. Don't think, oh, if I just get them to the church and they just hear Pastor Jack, I'll send them the message and then they'll get saved. That's not usually how God works. If someone gets to the church and gets saved, it's only because God's been doing a work in and through you in their lives. Do you understand that? Because how many people do you know if you just said, hey, show, like just show up to a random church. If you walked up to a random stranger and just said, hey, go to church over at that church on Sunday, the services, you know, uh, whatever time, 7, 9.30, you know. Do you think they're going to show up? No. It's impersonal. They don't know you. But when you know someone and you invite them to church and they come with you and they get saved, like Paul said, one waters, one plants, one puts the seed in the ground, and God gives the increase. We're all, gentlemen, a part of this horticulture community. You understand that? God might be using you to toss out seeds. God might be using you to water the seeds. God might be using you, and this is hard, in the life of someone who doesn't want God or doesn't seem like they want God, and everything about them seems like they hate your guts. It might just be because your message is hitting home. It might just be because your life and your lifestyle And the way you choose to talk and the way you choose to act and the fact that you choose to be upright and the fact that you choose to pay your taxes and all that business and you show them what a real God-fearing man looks like, that they are really struggling with that. And it may be that God's using you to break up the fallow ground of their hearts. But you are each an epistle. And to one man, you are the smell of death. You are a stench. And to another, the sweet aroma leading to life. To those that are being saved or to those that are perishing. But it's not up to us to determine who is who and what's what or to even worry about that. It's up to us to be a part of the process. Last verse, look at Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Isaiah 6, verse 8. We'll call it the Isaiah mandate. 
Isaiah 6, verse 8. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? That I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and tell this people. Father, we come before you tonight and thank you for this time in your word and for these men in this room. And Lord, I pray for each and every man in this room and the witness and the testimony that they have outside the four walls of this building and pray, God, that you would use them to your glory. And no doubt in a room this size, we have some Jonas. We have many Isaiahs, for sure. Lord, those that are saying, here am I, send me. And then some saying, "Uh uh-uh, I don't want to go. Don't send me. Send someone else. But Lord, you are a gracious and a merciful and a loving God. You saved us. You saved me. And Lord, I'm so grateful. I didn't want to go listen to that preacher that night my dad invited me. I didn't want anything to do with you. I wanted to live in my sin. But Lord, in your great love, you didn't flick me in the head. You didn't threatened me, you drew me with your gentle bands of love. Your Bible says that it's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. And so I pray tonight, Lord, you would use us to your glory. May we not count our lives dear. We surrender to you. God, go before us tonight in our small groups, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.